there's so much great work being done right now that does connect farms to New Yorkers. Are you or the mayor's office looking at program expansion with those organizations or working off of those models to further that? The state that is home to one in nine Americans, California, is on a hydrological cliff right now. Um, they also provide, because of the way our structure is, half of the food that we have. They have to completely rethink their agriculture um, and their energy um, extraction, which brings us to the opportunity for New York and others, other states on this side to, to we grow family farms, certainly in the food shed of New, New York, but that raises a whole other thing. The main thing that we have going for them is not only the soil and the climate, but we're like the hydrological wonderland. One in five Americans source their water from upstate New York. So while we have a ban on fracking, so-called, we have a governor that's turned the other way on infrastructure, which puts tremendous pressure not only on our state, but on places like Pennsylvania, which is in the, the watershed. So the city has to come out with an energy policy that um, is coordinated with preserving its, its, its freshwater access. And as you probably know, we have a wonderful agreement um, that's working with the farmers in the Delaware Catskill watershed. So we have to grow that. We can't use gas as a bridge fuel. It's not. We have to go elsewhere because the concept of terroir Coal covers everything. So I'm wondering, one is what thoughts you're given and what policy might be there to scale up as quickly as possible those farms within the, 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 the region to, to serve us. This is a really unique moment because we have a governor who is very committed to farming and farmers. That's a good thing. We have a deep, this is the kind of way I think about life. We have a DEP commissioner, uh, uh, Department of Environmental Protection commissioner, who's responsible for the watershed, for protecting it, who is very committed to the farmers in the watershed, even though I'm not sure there's enough that she could do to actually, you know, convince everyone that that's true, but and I understand that there's a lot of frustration there. Um, so we have a, an alignment here. Um, ESD, Empire State Development Corporation, which is the financing arm essentially of economic development projects in the state, and the city's EDC, Economic Development Corporation, which also finances a lot of what we do and holds a lot of leases on land in New York City. Uh, all of us are now at the table at a, in a conversation we call the Regional Food Hubs Task Force which is, um, but, but has become broader in our view. It's co-chaired by myself representing the city, by me representing the city, and by um, Richard Ball, who is a Schipari County carrot farmer, who is, also happens to be the commissioner of the Department of Ag and Markets. Anybody here from Ag and Markets today? Just, just checking, my new best friends. You may also know Richard because he's providing temporary support and uh, facilities to support urban health farms in his role as a farmer. He's a gentleman and a great help. So this group is meeting regularly now. Uh, our work is facilitated by Karen Park, who many of you know. There's a series of conversations going on um, to define where the gaps are in getting fresh local food into New York City. We have this crazy idea that over time, we're not going to do this in 90 days, believe me, but over time we will be able to create a, some common ground around identifying projects that need to be done, whether they are food or physical or virtual aggregation. Um, Hubs, whether they are co-packing operations, whether they are um, certain kinds of supports and, and technical assistance that are needed to develop and support relationships between upstate and downstate farmers, producers, distributors, and so on and so forth. 
that, you know, there have been many people who have been talked about to about this for years, and there's a lot of fatigue, um, interview fatigue, but I think we're kind of trying to move something very quickly so that we can at least announce a few projects in the short term, which would be, short term here being May or June. And then that this group is committed to being, I think, married for a while now um, to figure out what we can do. Part of this is going back to the, the conversation. So Emily Wood is on, in that group, who's the DEP person. Um, part of this also has to do with the, with the shed, the food shed, because the city is being asked, has a very specific ask from CA Hudson to put $5 million in each of 10 years into our capital budget to support the, the purchase of uh, land conservation easements. I personally think that this is, this is really, really important. Um, we're losing farms, we're not gaining farms. We will do well if we don't lose any, I mean, if the, if the goal were to say, let's not lose any more farms, that would be an ambitious goal. I mean, that is, that's just the fact of it. So again, we are, there are people who would question whether it's the municipality's responsibility to put any of its capital money into this, that it should be a state responsibility, that it should be a federal and state's responsibility. Um, it's not off the table with us at all uh, as we think about our 10-year capital plan. There's, there's often been conversations about that. And getting it in here. What I see in my colleagues and the other DPHOs is that there's more co-location happening in our neighborhoods versus other neighborhoods. And so co-location causes huge inequity because we have schools who can't adopt uh, um, alternative menus because they have to work with the other schools in the buildings. They have they cannot have a full time PE teacher because they only have access to the gym um, two days a week. So there's lots of things happening. Um, so I was wondering if there's any sort of policy about you know restricting the number of schools that are co located or things like that because it really does create huge inequities in, our in these neighborhoods. Well, I have to say this is one thing that nobody has met with me about because I'm not really the co location person. I, I get involved in this in the sense that we have kids who are eating lunches in these schools at 9.40 a.m. Um, right? And then, yeah, because you have to schedule everybody through, and for some reason the colleagues, they won't all eat together, which I think is just ridiculous. But I would encourage, you know, the chancellor would like to do something about that. I don't think it's an easy fix. I think it's a school by school fix. So it's not another, it's one of those other things where you can't wave a magic wand and say, voila, everybody in the lunchroom at one time, these schools were not built to, in many neighborhoods were not built to serve this many kids lunch at the same time. We have a serious facilities problem. We had a, we, we want to build farms on NYCHA property. Um, we have a, a, a plan from NYCHA to do that that is uh, resurrecting um, in this administration to replicate added value what, what added value did in, in, um, in Red Hook in at least six different developments. Again, a project that will take time, but the commitment is there and we're raising money, private and public, to do that. Um, the other piece of this is there's an initiative that has not really been launched, it's kind of soft launch. Building Healthy Communities Initiative, which is an effort to, um, part of that, it's, a, it's an open space initiative and part of the open space initiative, this was a place where I saw an opportunity to say, hey, gardens are in open, space, open spaces too, it's not just parks, it's not, it's not just um, what transportation is doing with transportation clauses. <coughs> the reference in the cold. And um, it's also about what do we do, you know, there's no cheaper way to build a community center than to build a garden. There's no cheaper way to build a classroom than to build a garden. There's no cheaper way uh, to build a community center, an interactive place for, for, for intergenerational activity, I'm sorry, I keep giving you guys my shoulder. Um, there's no better, there's no cheaper and easier way than to do a garden. Um, and so um, I am convinced that we need more to do more to solidify what's already there and to protect the gardens that are um, currently designated for development. There is a conversation going on about transferring as many gardens as we can from HPD to parks jurisdiction. Again, nothing that I can announce here, obviously, but we're in that, that conversation. There is an initiative um, uh, that you're thinking about, that you're announcing, that will use institutional food um, that the city has purchasing power over 
to turn around the local economy, both into obviously in terms of you think well, about, about turning around the disease epidemic with local. With, but go ahead. Sorry. Farm, with farms, you know, absolutely an equity issue, a health issue, uh, but also an economic development issue. If we could more locally source progressively, obviously you can't do it quickly, but move quickly toward uh, lo local sourcing as much as possible of all the institutions. What? Yes, I'm going to answer that we're doing our damnedest, yes. Yeah, and, and then I using this in economic development. Yeah. I mean, I think the question of co-ops um, and other food processing industries, those industries also are getting, or the workers are getting organized through groups like brand workers and others. So I think that there's a lot of synergy there that can uh, move together. We are trying to fulfill our vision, which is to change the mind, to change the habit. But what it is, we want to garden vertically, we want to garden uh, rooftop, we want to do aquaponics, but the money is not there. And that is an economic machine because in order to get really any of that running uh, efficiently, we have to employ some people. I can't do it all. So where, or uh, how can the city help us? If we have to be a model, we'd love to be a model so we can get the funds to do it. But where is this in the plan? I think you guys are kind of the brain trust and the food movement. And, you know, we, we talk to each other all the time and we kind of have an echo chamber going here and we're all on the same page. And what we, you know, I think the next step of this goes to the education question. Even if, and you're, you're right, it starts within different strands. I was really surprised when I first took this job that there was any sort of tension between food insecurity uh, and nutrition. <laughs> I was surprised by that because, you know, to me the larger issue is nutrition security. And um, and this goes to, dis I mean, it's all, these are diseases of poverty. You know, all the diseases we're talking about are diseases of poverty in the same way that AIDS became a disease of poverty. So uh, I just want to say that the way we're fra framing this, even among ourselves, as the environmental movement did, continue to have to reframe, 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 rethink broaden, you know, the camps are there, I get it, you know, but now the camps have to kind of come together and we all have to be on some kind of the same page about what we're going to go after because we need as many people as possible focusing very clearly on two or three trigger points that are going to help us here. Um, so the, the, the reason my, my job was created ostensibly is, you know, if you read the, I don't know, I'm sure you've all read the executive word that created this job, right? <laughs> oh, look, I have a copy here. <laughs> Coming from good employers, and, and again, I'm 
not to say it's like in a whiny way. I'm saying this. There's a whole list of public goods that we would like to generate with our procurement dollar because it is our it's a lot of money. We spend a quarter of a billion dollars on food every year in the city of New York, roughly. The primary reason that we care, we're caring about procurement right now and what this was set up to do has to do with promoting good health and reducing diet-related disease. That is clearly my mandate. I would test the premise, well, I wouldn't say I'd test the premise. I don't, I, I know we can do great good if we procure healthy food and get it to people who need it most with our public dollar. I would like there to be additional benefits to that, yes. Um, I think we have a deeper and, and challenge around the tension between paying people well and keeping prices down. I, that's an economic challenge that, again, I don't have a magic wand to solve. Um, the laws of supply and demand, I mean, there's, there's always that hope if we get more, if we just let the, the New York City market with enough fresh, local, you know, good food, that the prices will come down. I, I don't know. I don't know that that's true. I really don't know that that's true. Um, and that's when I go back to wages, right? And I go back to wages for every worker everywhere, whether it's farmers or people who are making your bread uh, at Tomcat or at uh, the, the place in California where it's made and put in plastic bags. You know, it doesn't really matter. Those are not those are not great paying jobs. If we made them better paying jobs, I have no confidence that the money would come out of the profits of those companies. I think the money would come out of the consumer. That's the problem. I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about how sustainable diets plays in the planet, MIC, and the food that you're working with, because it's a focus that I see a lot in the international community and in some other cities, London being one of them. Yeah, it's huge. Um, um, Europe, yes. But where I don't see as much of a conversation going on here, at least not describing it in those terms. And I think it's important because it looks holistically at all of the ideas that we've been talking about today in equity and food security and sustainability. This is the part where I say, when you see Plan Y, don't, don't expect pages and pages and pages of detail about each of these things. There are going to be things that we have sort of put pins in around this. And one of the things we've put pins in, I, I think, is about sustainability in the form of this relationship between the city and the state, which has not been explicit, and we're trying to make it more explicit. That's my short answer to that question. Um, I, I do worry about, you know, we, the whole climate change relationship to this conversation. Um, something that the city is in a reactive mode in relationship to, right? I mean, let's just be real. Again, this is something where we need to get on the horn with our, our you know, members of Congress. This is the issue we, will, you know, we need to vote on in 2016. We need to hold people accountable for talking about what their plan is for, you know, if, if you know, since California is direct, it's not if it's, it is, you know, California is drying up, you know, the food, the food sheds of America are going to move to the places where there's water. Uh, will we have reliable water anywhere? It's a question I have, right? Every, everywhere, I just heard Jane Goodall speak a couple uh, last week, and she says everywhere she goes around the world, everybody says the weather's weird. Everywhere around the world. Is there any place where the climate would be predictable enough for agriculture? These are like the questions that keep us all up at night. Um, if I could figure out a way for the city to do anything in addition to raising this question as a city and as, as one of many cities, one of the climate change cities, there's 40 of us in a, I don't know if you know the C40 cities, but we're part of this movement of, of C40 cities, which is very connected to food justice, that's raising these questions and, and looking for solutions through national and international.